What's going on, everyone? Jared Sandler here with our Rangers pregame news and notes conversation. We've got a lot to get through. Uh, let's start with the bullpen. The Rangers bullpen has been outstanding of late. I had fired off some tweets last night and again this morning. Over the last 10 games, Rangers relievers have been, for lack of a better word, dominant. Uh, they've posted a 152 ERA. They're giving the team about four and a third innings per game, so getting you know plenty of work. Uh, opposing hitters batting under 200 against them, an OPS under 500. And here's the key, a, a strikeout to walk rate of better than six to one. This is not a team that strikes out everyone in the world. Uh, it's not a relief core that does that. They average less than a strikeout per inning, not a ton less, but less than a strikeout per inning. But this relief unit leads Major League Baseball with the lowest walk rates. And they also lead the American League fifth overall in Major League Baseball in first pitch strike rate. They're pounding the zone. Their efficiency has been such a big part of their success. And I also want to quickly point out how last night's game was won in part because of the games leading up. Uh, the Rangers have played some close games. Boston on Sunday. And then all three games of this Minnesota series. When you play close games, you're going to use your high leverage reliever. Sometimes. You know, it's not a horrible thing if you're going to lose to just get blown out. I mean, I know that, you know, a, a coach or a manager or a GM might cringe hearing, you know, me say that if they're even watching, which they're not. But because then that way you can relieve all uh, rest, all your high leverage relievers. When you're in the middle of a stretch of 19 games in 19 days, it is very tough to keep your high leverage arms fresh in such a way that whenever they're needed, they're available. So I want to quickly detail the last uh, the last few games and show how last night was won in part because of the games leading up to that. On Sunday, the Rangers win. They get three relief innings, one each from Brett Martin, Josh Spores, and Ian Kennedy. Martin throws 10 pitches, Spores 15, Kennedy 5. No alarming numbers there. Efficient, getting outs, getting the job done. On Monday, I imagine Kennedy... Uh, probably a day off because it would have been his third third outing in a row. Uh, the Rangers had pretty much everyone else available, though. They didn't need anyone else. The Rangers lost, but Colby Allard gave them uh, two and a third innings or two and two thirds innings, 30 pitches. He was the only reliever that they used. So effectively, that was a night off in the middle of a stretch in which the game, the team does not have any nights off. Uh, for the rest of the relievers. So then you come back Tuesday, close game. This was the comeback win. Rangers scored, uh, you know, all those runs late, uh, two to tie and then three to take the lead in the 10th. You got 12 pitches in one inning out of Joely Rodriguez. And then Ian Kennedy needed seven pitches in the bottom of the 10th. So Rodriguez through the bottom of the ninth and uh, Kennedy, the bottom of the 10th credit to Kyle Gibson for giving you eight innings as a starting pitcher and only requiring two relief innings. But because of that yesterday, the Rangers got a combined five and two thirds innings using high leverage relievers, John King, Brett Martin, Joely Rodriguez, Ian Kennedy, Ian Kennedy pitching for the fourth time in five days, probably because he's throwing fewer than 14 pitches per inning. He needed just five on Sunday, just seven uh, the night before. Uh, and so, you know, in three days, he had thrown a combined 12 pitches, Joely Rodriguez, same thing. Uh, you know, he had been super efficient and was once again last night. So, you know, these things contribute. The fact that John King was fresh, he it enabled you to get multiple innings out of John King, two and two thirds. Uh, it just, you know, these things really make a difference. Now, today, Rangers would probably like to stay away from Joely Rodriguez and Ian Kennedy. And if that comes back to bite them, it comes back to bite them. But they've already gotten two wins out of this four game series on the road. Plus, they have Josh Spores, who's available. Brett Martin, who's available as well. Uh, so it's not like you don't have anyone to turn to, but it is going to be important for Jordan Lyles to try and give them some depth. So, you know, this could turn quickly at no fault of the Rangers. You know, perhaps today's a day, especially a day game after the night game where they're not as deep uh, in the bullpen, but they were able to get wins in close games, playing four straight close games in part because of how efficiently this bullpen has worked. And uh, I, I just can't say enough about what this bullpen has done of late and how the domino effect has really made a big difference. Uh, Nate Lowe, you know, I love a good streak. Nate Lowe uh, is riding a streak right now. He's reached base in 18 straight games, second longest streak by a Ranger this year. Joey Gallo has the longest at 23. His streak's no longer active. He's currently tied with Alex Verdugo, who has a 23-game streak that is active for the longest in Major League Baseball. 
Uh, but Nate Lowe doing a nice job. One way Nate Lowe's doing it is simply taking advantage of getting ahead of the count. You know, a lot was made about Nate Lowe's patience during spring training when maybe it was too patient. Well, the patience is really paying off here in the regular season because when he's getting ahead of the count one and oh, he's hitting 422. Uh, and that's the fifth best figure in Major League Baseball. So, you know, if he sees ball one, he's getting a hit 42% of the time, uh, you know, as the bat plays out. Again, that's fifth best in Major League Baseball. And then while this doesn't necessarily contribute to on base streak, it does contribute to his overall effectiveness. And that is that when he gets ahead 1-0, and Nate Lowe's slugging percentage is over 900. And that figure is the best in the majors. All six of his home runs have come after he gets ahead of the count 1-0. and He's got 10 extra base hits when he gets ahead of the count, 1-0. and Those two numbers also rank best in Major League Baseball. So Nate Lowe doing a nice job, and, and just the willingness to take ball one uh, is a big reason why. Another straight Charlie Culberson is in the lineup yet again today uh, with Brock Holt hurt. There's not as much of a platoon. Charlie Culberson hits in nine straight. He's hitting 300 on the year, so nice to see there from a, a guy who's brought on to be a veteran presence to fill uh, some opportunities. He's getting a little more of one because of, uh, because of injuries. Uh, all right. Uh, you know, quickly, uh, a quick little look at the minors. I'm not going to read too much into individual performances thus far. You know, I mentioned Evan Carter yesterday. I love uh, the plate discipline. I love the contact ability. You look at the body, look at the length and the bat speed power is going to be a part of his game. Really good defensively. He's someone to watch. We'll keep you posted as the seasons really start to unfold and we get, you know, not even full sample sizes or anything close to that, but let's just give it a week. You know, we can say, hey, this guy's off to a good start or whatever. Uh, one guy I'll identify who is off to a good start, but that's not why I'm identifying uh, this player. And that's Bubba Thompson. Uh, this is a guy who was at one point a uh, top five prospect for the Rangers. Now, uh, I don't even know if he's in the top 30 because of uh, just a stagnant progression journey due in part to bad luck with COVID, but also injuries. You know, he's been plagued by injuries and hasn't taken the steps that I think some people believe that he's capable of taking. He's at double A Frisco this year. And uh, it's kind of a, a, you know, a put up or shut up type year for Bubba. You know, if, if there's no real progression, then he might find himself in another organization, but he still uh, is young enough and has the chance to, to show that there's a future there for him. But this is going to be a big year, especially doing it at double A. Uh, Round Rock begins tonight because Round Rock was used as an alternate site location. The, the, the start to their season was delayed. There are other, I think a few other minor league uh, teams that experience a little bit of a delay for the same reason, but Round Rock starts tonight. Leody Tavares is with Round Rock. He's a guy uh, for sure that uh, is worth following uh, and just tracking his continued progress. I got a great question from uh, a, a great Rangers fan, Reagan on Twitter. He was asking me if the Rangers should, avoid Jordan Lawler in the draft because of some of the guys they have in their system. And, and this is a common question and I get it because in the NBA and the NFL, you have guys who get drafted and they play right away. The NHL, it's, you know, kind of in between the NBA and the NFL and then where major league baseball is uh, you have guys who get drafted and they play right away. Uh, you don't have that in the majors uh, with the draft, you know, Jordan Lawler specifically, he's a high school kid. So you got to expect that it's going to be at least two years before it's really a discussion as to when he comes up, unless things really, really go well in his development. And it might be three, three and a half years before he's getting everyday playing time. And that's okay. You know, that puts him at 21, 22 years old. Uh, there's nothing wrong with that. But point being, a lot can change over that time. The other thing is, let's just use the Chiefs as an example. Uh, the Chiefs aren't going to draft a quarterback in the first round right now. For one, a quarterback only plays quarterback, right? You know, it's not like, oh, okay, well, we got two quarterbacks. Let's move one to receiver. And the other thing is, you know, the expectation is in the NFL, if you're drafting a first-round quarterback, uh, he's going to play right away. And if not quite right away, uh, he better be someone you realistically can think uh, think can play the very next year. And if Patrick Mahomes is your quarterback, you know, why are you wasting a, a draft asset on that? Well, in baseball, you know, a couple of things. One, let's just hypothetically say that the Rangers went and they signed – Trevor Story or Corey Seager, one of these shortstops next year. And Jordan Lawler in this crazy world is so good from the time he's drafted through the end of spring training that the Rangers are like, how can we keep this guy from being in the big leagues? Guess what? He can play second. He can play center. He can play third. You know, a shortstop is someone that usually can play other positions. If you're a shortstop center fielder, uh, you usually can move around a little bit. Uh, and the other thing is uh, just, you know, being more realistic uh, you just never know what's going to happen with these guys. Maybe the Rangers do sign Trevor Story, but by the time Jordan Lawler is ready to come up, Trevor Story's got 
two years left on his deal. Jordan Lawler plays second, or maybe at that point, Trevor Story's a little older and maybe he plays second, Lawler plays short, whatever. You know, you, you, you can never draft too many center fielders, shortstops, pitchers. You'll find a way to make it work, especially because, uh, you know, a lot of the guys in the minor leagues, the reality is most of them don't pan out. Uh, you know, you, you got to find the, the diamonds there, but most of them don't pan out. So the more options you have, the better off you are. Quickly around Major League Baseball, uh, the Astros are complaining about the way they're treated in New York. Just pipe it. I mean, the, let's not sound so tone deaf here. Uh, the Astros continue to dig a hole deeper and deeper and deeper. You cheated and you're getting away with it. All right. Uh, I don't know how it's going to impact guys in free agency. I'll be, cur- I'll be curious to see if Carlos Correa has less of a market because he was tied to this Astros team. And frankly, he's been at the forefront of handling this poorly. Uh, but, you know, either way, uh, you cheated, you won the World Series. It's still yours. It's always going to be in the record books. It has not been and will not be taken away. Uh, so you just need to deal with it. You need to wear it. All right. And understand that last year when the vitriol was probably at the highest, you didn't have to deal with these fans. So the Yankees fans are upset because your uh, your horrible actions impacted their ability to win a World Series. You need to deal with it. If someone's getting hurt, you know, if someone is a fan is throwing batteries at play. All right. That's different. All right. But if you're just upset because they're taunting you or they're chanting things, grow up. All right. Let's not sound so uh, so ignorant here. Finally, John Means yesterday threw a no-hitter, first no-hitter of its kind, the only no-hitter in history in which uh, there were no errors, no walks, no-hit batters, but was not a perfect game because the only, and and you face the minimum, the only batter reached uh, because of a dropped third strike, and then that batter was then thrown out trying to steal. It has led a lot of people to ask a question that other people have asked before, but now it's, it's more in the spotlight. Why the heck do we have a dropped third strike rule? And I asked Chris Woodward about this, and he's like, yeah, I don't really know either. I don't what what's the impetus of this rule? Why? Why does the drop third strike rule exist? And then why, when there's a runner on first uh, or, you know, the, 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 you know, first base is occupied, does it not matter? But then why all of a sudden with two outs, it doesn't matter where the runners are. It matters again. It just, I don't understand this rule. Uh, you throw a pitch, the batter swings, he misses and you struck him out. Why, why does it matter if the ball was caught or not? I don't understand that. Uh, I'm not like willing to throw all my chips in the middle and stand up on the hill and say, take my house and take my car, get this rule changed. I don't feel like that passionately about it, but I do. It falls in the category for me of why I I'd like to know why does this rule exist? What is the point? What is the purpose? I'd really like to know. And and yesterday's no hitter brings that to the forefront. There you go. That's our pregame news and notes conversation. Talk to you tomorrow. Have a great day.